Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so my name is Alex. I'm a research scientist at Element AI. This is some work that I did during my PhD at Laval University with Francois Laviolette. Uh, so it's going to be about how we can use machine learning to predict antibiotic resistance phenotypes. So uh, this is an outline of my talk. I'll start by saying what's a genotype, what's a phenotype. Uh, and then I'll spend most of my time talking about predicting discrete phenotypes, so resistant or susceptible to a given antibiotic. Uh, and then I will briefly cover predicting continuous phenotypes. In this case, it's going to be minimum inhibitory concentrations, uh, and that's it. So first of all, what's a genotype and what's a phenotype? Uh, a genotype is the set of characteristics of the DNA of an individual. So we could say that it's the set of mutations in the genome of an individual. Uh, and a phenotype is the set of observable characteristics. So this could be, does this individual have a given disease or not? Or does this individual uh, resist or not to a given treatment? And our objective will be to find biomarkers, so measurable characteristics of the genome, that allow us to predict the occurrence of a phenotype. Uh, in our case, this will be uh, for instance, can we find mutations or genes that are predictive of antibiotic resistance? So we want to find this kind of biomarker, first of all, to better understand the biological process that underlie a phenotype. If we know which genes are involved, uh, we might be able to understand the process better. Uh, and we could also use this kind of biomarker to create better diagnostic tests uh, to try to anticipate phenotypes before they actually occur. Okay, so this is going to be of particular interest in our case. So we'll be interested in antibiotic resistance, which is a state in which bacteria become able to survive in the presence of an antibiotic. Uh, this is a big public health problem right now. It's uh, increasingly important. Uh, actually, it compromises our ability to treat common infections. So um, a patient can come to the hospital and antibiotics can be uh, less effective or even ineffective in treating the infection. Uh, and this results in increased healthcare costs. Uh, and also increase morbidity in some cases when the patients are already sick or have some other uh, health problem. Uh, so this is a big problem. In the US alone, it's estimated that it costs about $30 billion every year in additional health healthcare costs uh, just to deal with this, the problem of antibiotic resistance. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's an important problem. And it mostly occurs due to genome modification. So it could be because of mutations or also the acquisition of resistance genes. Uh, and what happens is that our current way of using antibiotics favors the selection of individuals that are resistant to the drugs. OK, so um, this, this picture is actually a screenshot from a video that was put online by the Harvard Medical School. Uh, and so each of those vertical rectangles right there uh, correspond to an increasing concentration of antibiotic. So this is a big Petri dish, and on each side you have, let's say, one unit of antibiotic, and in the center you have 1,000 times more antibiotic. So what the researchers did is that they put bacteria over here and on that side, and they let them grow for a period of 11 days. Uh, and what they noticed is that bacteria were able to grow until, uh, up until the center. So there's 1,000 times more antibiotics there, and bacteria were still able to adapt uh, through mutation and through the acquisition of uh, resistance genes. Uh, so we really need to use antibiotics properly because bacterial populations will develop resistance uh, and pretty quickly. Okay, so uh, this brings us to the question of why we would like to predict antibiotic resistance using machine learning. Uh, well, first of all, it would be really uh, interesting to be able to screen rapidly which antibiotics would be effective in treating an infection. Okay, let's say I have um, a bacteria in front of me, and I want to say uh, if a an un given antibiotic will be able or not to destroy it. Okay, so this would be a discrete phenotype, like I'm going to cover in the next slides. Uh, so that's important, and uh, if we're able to do that, we would be able to develop treatment plans that are tailored to the infection of an individual. Okay, so specifically based on the population of bacteria that are infecting an individual, uh, and this is an application of what we call personalized medicine. Uh, and if we were able to do that, it would allow us to avoid or even shorten, actually shorten or even avoid empiric therapy, uh, which is a process by which a, a doctor will prescribe a treatment um, based on prior knowledge of the infection. So we're not sure what the infection is. Uh, we're maybe going to do some kind of culture to confirm the resistance profile of the infection. But meanwhile, the patient will receive an antibiotic. 
So by being able to predict effective, uh, very efficiently the resistance profile of a bacterium, we would be maybe able to avoid that. Okay, so that is the end objective, and this would result in lower health care, health care costs uh, and maybe lower morbidity uh, if patients uh, have another health problem and they receive an ineffective antibiotic. Right, so uh, the last point is that if we had accurate models of antibiotic resistance, we might even be able to uh, try to understand how they're making predictions uh, and try to gain new biological knowledge from those models. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show an example of that in a few slides. So the first part of my talk is about predicting discrete phenotypes. Uh, and this little cartoon shows uh, the setup that we're going to be interested in. So uh, we're going to have two sets of individuals, okay, so two sets of bacteria, some that are resistant to an antibiotic and some that are sensitive. And we'll have the genomes of those bacteria. And what we're going to do is give those genomes to a learning algorithm that's going to compare them and then produce a model that's able to discriminate them. So to say, given a new genome, is this the genome of a resistant bacteria or a susceptible one? Okay, so this is just a cartoon explaining what we want to do. Um, and actually, this is a supervised learning problem. Okay, so in supervised learning, uh, we have examples that are um, X's and Y's. So the X's here are genomes. So it's basically any sequence of nucleotides, A, C, G, T. And the Y's are phenotypes. <clears throat> so this could be an integer. It could be uh, 0 or 1 for, uh, let's say, 0 for resistant and 1 for sensitive to a given antibiotic. And D is an unknown distribution that actually mimics the biological process behind the data. So it's the data generating distribution, and we don't know what it is. So our first objective is to find a vector representation of genomes. So the algorithms that we use don't work with sequences, uh, as you'll see in a few slides. They work with vectors. So we need to take the genome and then convert it into a vector. Uh, so we'll define that uh, kind of function that takes a genome and produces a vector of dimension d. And given that vector, we'll want a model that can accurately predict the phenotype. So a, a model is a function that takes as input the vector representation of a genome and then just outputs 0 or 1. And we want it to have good generalization performance. So this means that for any example from the same distribution d, we want the prediction to be equal to the phenotype. Okay, this is our objective. That's what we want to do. And uh, we add an additional constraint that the models should be interpretable. And this is really important because we want to, first of all, be able to validate the models to see if they're using uh, mutations or genes that make sense. They're not using some artifacts in the data. Uh, and we also want to be able to gain possibly new biological knowledge from these models. Okay, so we add this constraint about interpretability. So, yeah, first of all, I said we needed a vector representation of genomes, and the one we use in this work is the KMER profile. Uh, so a KMER is a sequence of K nucleotides, uh, so there's four to the power K possibilities. In this work, we use K equals 31. We found that this is a good value for comparing bacterial genomes. Uh, so there's four to the 31 possibilities. This is a huge representation space, um, and so actually four to the power 31 is bigger than 10 to the 18. Okay, it's a very, very big number. Uh, and so this is really challenging for learning algorithms, mainly because it's a very high dimensional representation. Uh, in practice, we limit ourselves to the cameras that we observe in the data. So we define this set K that contains all the cameras that we observe in the data. And then we create this vector uh, that has a zero if a camera is not in the data and a one if it's there. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that this is the set of all six mers that were observed in the data and X is a small genome, then the corresponding KMER profile is this one. There is a one for the KMER C-A-G-A-T-A, -A, because it's the first substring, zero for this one, because it's not in the genome, and then there's one for this one as well, because it's A-G-A-T-A-G, -A -A -G, it's the second substring. Okay, so this example shows you that we consider some kind of sliding window of sequence on, on the genome of length K. Okay, so this is the representation that we'll use. So this representation is nice because it allows us to use machine learning algorithms with genomes. It allows genome comparison without actually having to do some multiple sequence alignment. It's a reference-free method, uh, although it comes with a few challenges for learning algorithms. Uh, and this is really typical of genomic data. We usually call that the fat data setting, 
Uh, it's kind of the transpose of the big data setting. Uh, so in fat data, you have very few observations, or so very few examples, but they're very high dimensional. Okay, so this is the setting in genomics, and in big data, you have uh, sm a small dimensionality, but a lot of observations. Okay, so fat data is a lot more challenging, uh, and so to add to that, in our case, we'll also have a lot of class imbalance. And class imbalance means that we have a lot more resistant examples than susceptible ones for some antibiotics, and sometimes it's the opposite way around. So this adds another challenge for learning algorithms. Right, so, so this figure is showing, um, so in this figure, each dot is actually a data set, and a data set corresponds to one species and one antibiotic. Uh, these data sets were extracted from the Patrick database, which is a, a big database of antibiotic resistance data. Uh, so what this is showing is for each data set, the number of genomes and the number of chemers in tens of millions. Okay, so what we can see is that very often we have a few hundred genomes uh, with respect to a few, so, so to tens of millions uh, of chemers. So there's really a big imbalance between the number of examples and the dimensionality of what we call the feature space in this case. Okay, so this makes for a quite challenging problem. So in order to be able to learn from this data, we can't use really complicated models that would likely overfit the data. So overfitting means to learn the training data uh, perfectly but not work well, not make accurate predictions on unseen data. We need to use simple models that have a very constrained structure so in our case, we use rule-based models. Uh, a rule-based model is basically any model that makes predictions by answering a series of questions. Uh, so in our case, the questions will capture the presence or absence of any camera in the data. So let's say this is a rule, okay? It's one of the questions. It takes as input the representation of a genome and then outputs true or false. And the type of models that we're going to consider are conjunctions and disjunctions, so logical and and logical or, or also decision trees. Okay, so let's start with this one. Uh, this is a logical and, it's actually R1 and not R2. So R1 over here, if it's true, we go over here, and then we ask the question R2, if it's true, we go here, and then we end up predicting minus, so this would be maybe uh, susceptible, and if it's false, then we go to this one, and we predict Plus, okay, so this could be resistant, for instance. Okay, so the models we're going to learn will capture the presence or absence of chemers and then uh, direct the predictions into one leaf that will predict the phenotype. Okay, so this is a logical arrangement of rules that allows us to make predictions. Uh, so the, our initial work was on set covering machines. These are nice because they produce very simple models. Uh, if you're able to understand uh, the rules, so which chemers are used to make predictions, uh, then you're able to interpret these models, it's quite nice, uh, but they're quite constrained, so we analyze as well classification trees, especially the, the CART algorithm of Leo Breiman, uh, and these are nice because they actually learn disjunctions of conjunctions, so they're uh, much more powerful than the models that set covering machines can learn. Okay, so I'll show results for both algorithms in a few slides. Uh, so we, we did a lot of work on this topic. Uh, we actually have three papers on the subject. Um, so our main results were that uh, both algorithms are interesting because they can be implemented out of core. Uh, out of core means that you can actually train the algorithm without loading all the data into memory. Okay, you can load only small chunks of the data in memory uh, and do the computation that trains the algorithm. Uh, so this allows us to scale to really large genomic data sets. Uh, we found that because these models were so constrained and structured, they were able to avoid overfitting most of the time, or to overfit less, uh, and this made them outperform a bunch of uh, state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms. Uh, we also uh, got some theoretical performance guarantees. So these are mathematical expressions that guarantee that the algorithms will work uh, based on some properties of the model. So uh, we could say with high confidence, this model will make no more than a certain percentage of error on unseen data. Okay, so we have these kinds of guarantees for these two algorithms. Uh, and finally, we showed that the models can make, uh, that, that the models are actually interpretable for a wide variety of species and antibiotics. Uh, so I'll cover a few of these results in the next slides. Uh, so first of all, this result is about the interpretability of the models. Uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit complicated for a slide, so let me walk you through it. Uh, what you're seeing on this side 
is actually models that predict canamycin resistance in mycobacterium tuberculosis. And this is meropenem resistance in Klebsiella pneumoniae. Uh, you have the decision tree model on this side, and then the set covering machine model. So each of these rectangles correspond to a rule. Okay, so this is a rule that captures the presence or the absence of a kamer. Uh, and the rules are colored according to where in the genome the kamers were found. So we, we took the rule, we looked at the kamer sequence, we used BLAST, and then we, we looked where it hit in some annotated genomes, and then we colored them according to that. So what we found uh, is that very often we are actually finding some kamers in known resistance genes uh, or known resistance conferring uh, mutations. And uh, it's nice because we recovered these resistance determinants uh, only from the data. We had no prior knowledge of antibiotic resistance. We just ran the learning algorithms on the data and let them learn a model that accurately discriminates resistant and susceptible examples. And we're lucky enough to find uh, true resistance mechanisms that had been confirmed uh, experimentally. So this is an example that shows that if we don't have some prior knowledge of a phenotype, we might be able to learn to use machine learning algorithms to actually recover some actionable biological knowledge from the data. Um, so that's one level of interpretation. The other one is if you look at the leaves over here, so um, the ring here shows the proportion of genomes with a given phenotype in the leaves. So for instance, let's look at this one. There's some resistant uh, isolates, okay? The legend is over here if you want to, to see. So you have resistant isolates and then susceptible ones. Uh, so these w this would mean that it resists to the antibiotic and this, it doesn't resist. Uh, and there's 45 genomes that ended up in this leaf. Okay, so we can see uh, how well a model can separate uh, our genomes. Um, and what's also interesting is that if you look at the models of, the, of CART, so the classification tree algorithm and then the set covering machine one, you see that there is this very impure leaf in the set covering machine model. Uh, it contains genomes from both classes. And in the CART model, there's, a, uh, there's an additional rule that actually separates them. Okay, so um, we found that by allowing models that are s slightly more complicated than set covering machines, we're able to learn models that work a little bit better. Uh, and they still avoid overfitting. So this was one of our results to actually show that even though these algorithms are more complicated, they're still able to learn uh, some very concise models that highlight known resistance determinant uh, and that do not overfit too much. So I, oh yeah, last thing. Um, you see this number in bold in each rule. This is the number of equivalent rules uh, because what happens is that sometimes when you have a mutation, all the kamers that will overlap this mutation will be equivalent, okay? They will be equally predictive of the phenotype. So we found that by looking at this number, we're able to say if it's a mutation or the presence or absence of a gene that is predictive of the phenotype. Uh, so here, for instance, it would be a mutation, and here it's likely that it would be the presence of a gene, okay? And we actually confirmed that. It's the presence of a gene that is predictive of resistance. Uh, and to show you another example, oh yeah, okay. Uh, here is a set of 15 kamers that were equivalent, and they're, we put them on the sequence of the gene. Okay, so this is their position in base pairs. Uh, and actually, the region shown in red is a known resistance mutation hotspot. Uh, for, um, it, the, the antibiotic here is isonized. Okay, so this is in the catalase peroxidase gene, and it's a, it's a known hotspot for resistance mutations. And we see that all the kamers actually overlap this position. So it's the only point where all the kamers overlap, actually. So by looking at where the cameras overlap, we're able to go and pinpoint the exact mutation that's causing uh, or is associated with resistance in this case. Okay, so it allows us to go beyond cameras using only uh, camera sequence and um, rule-based models. So, yeah. So it's good to have interpretable models, but it's not worth anything if they're not accurate. So I need to show a result about their accuracy. Um, here I'm showing results for 12 species uh, 12 bacterial species and 56 different antibiotics. Uh, each dot is a data set, so they're the same data sets as in the previous figure that I showed. Uh, so you have the results for CART, and this is the decision tree algorithm, and you also have the results for set covering machines. Uh, and this is the accuracy, uh, so towards the center is the best accuracy. One means 100% 100 um, accuracy on unseen data, so it means that the model would make correct predictions all the time. Uh, so what we want is to have a distribution that's towards the center. And the first thing we can observe 
is that both algorithms perform quite comparably. Okay, and this is interesting because CART produces models that are strictly more complex uh, and still avoids overfitting in this case. Uh, and you can also notice that the models are quite accurate. 95% uh, of our models have an accuracy, so percentage of correct predictions, greater than 80%. And 75% of them make correct predictions 90% of the time. And this is on held out data that wasn't seen during training. Okay? So we can say that the models are interpretable, uh, they're quite accurate, and we also have theoretical results that are in line with those empirical results um, that also support that we're able to learn accurate models uh, from genomic data of very high dimensions. So uh, finally, final results for uh, categorical phenotypes. Uh, I just want to point out that the CART, so the decision tree algorithm, is able to learn, um, is, is able to do multi-class classification. So we're able to uh, learn to predict binary phenotypes, resistant or susceptible, but also uh, more complex phenotypes, so categorical, uh, with more than two categories. So in this case, we just tried to predict the species from the genome, which is quite easy. It was just a proof of concept. Uh, we see that this is a 12th class problem and we're still doing pretty well. We have the same performance guarantees and the same out of core implementation. Good. So, so that's all for um, discrete phenotypes. And then this is the last part of my talk on continuous phenotypes. Specifically, uh, we will be focusing on predicting minimum inhibitory concentrations. Okay, so I'll just say MIC because it's faster. Uh, MIC is the smallest concentration of an antibiotic that you need to destroy a bacterium. Okay, let's leave it to that. And what you see here is a Petri dish uh, with white spots correspond to uh, little antibiotic disks. Uh, and towards the center of a, of a disk, the concentration is greater. Okay, so in the center, the concentration is greater. And as you move away from the, the, the disk, the concentration uh, is smaller. So you can measure the minimum inhibitory concentration by looking at the radius around uh, the disk where bacteria grew or didn't grow. Okay, so to give you an example, uh, if we have this, for example, over here, uh, and the concentration in the center is 64 milligrams per liter, we see that bacteria grew all the way to the disk, so we don't know what the actual minimum inhibitory concentration is. We can just say it's greater than 64 milligrams per liter. This is the only information that we can get from this assay. Now, if we have this case, well, let's say that this is the furthest we're able to measure. Okay, it's the smallest concentration we're able to detect. And let's suppose it's 0 0.02 milligrams per liter. Um, we can only say that the minimum in the return concentration is smaller or equal to that. We don't actually know what the true minimum in the return concentration is. Uh, and then if we have something with an intermediate radius, in this case, we're able to have an exact value of resistance. All right, so um, there's these three cases that we should consider. And actually, when we have only partial information about the data, this is called censoring. Okay, so we have a continuous phenotype. We want to predict the level of resistance in some sort, uh, but we have partial information in some cases. Now, if we look at this a little bit more formally, we see that it's still a supervised learning problem. We have X's and Y's, X's are genomes, Y's are, in this case, intervals. Okay, so they're, they're different. Um, and so an interval has a lower limit, lower bound, and an upper bound. Um, and so in our case, we'll have these types of censoring. We'll have right censored data. So we could say that um, the MIC is greater or equal to some value. Okay, so this means an interval from the value up to infinity. We have no more information about this data. It could also be left censored, so we might know that uh, y is smaller or equal to some value. Okay, so this is an open interval on the left. It's called left censored. You could have interval censored data, which is just when you have a lower bound and an upper bound on the actual minimum inhibitory concentration. And finally, this generalizes um, the regular case. So the, the, in general, we have uncensored data. So this is when you do regression. Uh, like linear regression, for instance, you have uncensored data where you have an exact measurement uh, of minimum inhibitory concentration. Okay, so this is the type of data we'll consider. Uh, I think it's interesting because it's, uh, it's kind of a, a different supervised learning problem from regression and classification that we're used to encountering. Uh, there's not a lot of algorithms to work with this kind of data. Um, so let's see how we measure the prediction of a model with respect to an interval. 
Okay, so that's important if we want to make an algorithm for that task. Uh, so suppose we have this case. It's an interval censored point. Uh, so we have a lower limit for the interval and an upper limit for the interval. Uh, and let's say we have a model, H, that takes as input a genome X and then makes a prediction. If the prediction is inside the interval, then there is zero loss. Uh, and if the prediction is outside of the interval, then we have a loss that increases based on the distance from the interval. Okay, so it could increase quadratically, as I shown in red, or it could increase linearly, as is shown in blue. Okay, and this also uh, can be generalized to all the other cases. So let's say we have right-centered data. We have zero penalty if we predict a value up to infinity, but we do if we predict something smaller, so outside of the interval. Okay, uh, and then and the um, typical case is uncensored data. So this is. Uh, equivalent to the losses we use for uh, real-valued regression. Good. So uh, we actually proposed a decision tree algorithm for that. Uh, this was at the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference. Uh, it's actually uh, a nonlinear regression algorithm that is rule-based and that also does uh, interval regression. Uh, it's called maximum margin interval trees. I won't go into the details, but uh, I just want to say that we have a, we propose a dynamic programming algorithm that allows to train this type of model uh, quite efficiently. And in the next few slides, I'm going to show you how we can use it to actually predict minimum inhibitory concentrations. So this is the problem setting we're interested in. We want to go from KMERS to a model and then to minimum inhibitory concentrations. Uh, the state of the art for doing this is actually two fairly recent papers. Uh, what they do is they use regular regression, so real value regression, but they convert the intervals into real values using some approximation. So if you get a value that's smaller or equal to some value, they will just say y equals that value divided by 2. And if it's greater, they'll just say y equals that value times 2. Okay, so this is an approximation. Uh, it's valid, but as you'll see, it reduces the performance of the models. Uh, what we propose to do is to actually use the true interval uh, nature of the data and use an interval regression algorithm. In our case, it's going to be the maximum interval trees algorithm. Uh, and this is nice because it actually uses the exact structure of the data. There is no approximation. You use the uncertainty on the minimum inhibitory concentration measurements. Um, so. In this figure, what I'm showing is a comparison of a regression tree. So this is a regular decision tree model for regression. Uh, and this, on this axis, is actually our interval regression approach, uh, the MMIT algorithm. Uh, when a value is below the diagonal, it means that the interval regression approach yields better results. So as you can see, most of the time, it does give better results. Uh, and I forgot to mention, but those blue dots are actually antibiotics, and we're predicting uh, MIC values for Klebsiella pneumoniae. Okay, so uh, this is the accuracy, so it's the proportion of times the prediction is inside of the expected interval. Okay, so uh, it really measures the accuracy of both algorithms. So as you can see, MMIT significantly outperform uh, the real valued approach, uh, and it's nice because this is again a rule-based model based on KMERS, so we still get interpretable models uh, that are rule-based, so we're able to see which cameras are used to, for making predictions. Uh, so that's all I had to say about um, minimum inhibitory concentrations. So to conclude, uh, we are able to predict, to do genotype to phenotype prediction for binary, n airy and continuous phenotypes uh, with possible censoring in the data. We obtain interpretable models that explicitly highlight the importance of some cameras and specific regions of the genome for making uh, phenotypic predictions. We have accurate models for a bunch of uh, antibiotic resistance phenotypes. Uh, we also have performance guarantees based on sample compression theory. Uh, and the algorithms are quite scalable. Uh, they are implemented out of core, so you don't use all the memory of the computer. And we make no assumption on the type of organism or phenot phenotype. Uh, in this work, I focused on antibiotic resistance, but in practice, you could reuse the same algorithm for other phenotypes and possibly other organisms. So. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I want to thank all the co-authors on all of these papers, uh, Sebastien, which is in the room today, and uh, the implementation is over here if you want to try it. Thank you.